Welcome everyone. Just take your seats. Please be welcome. We are at the start of the week of inspiration, a week packed with uh, inspirational speakers about a variety of topi uh, topics. We, Studium Generale, and a committee of students have organized uh, eight lectures on behalf of the University of Twente to celebrate the anniversary of the university, the DS on Friday. Fortunately, it's Monday now, and I'm very glad to announce our first speaker, Rosanne Herzberger. She's a microbiologist, but I guess a lot of you know her because of her opinions uh, during uh, talk show uh, television shows uh, or um, expressed in columns. She writes, for uh, example, for uh, the NSA. Those columns often provoke a lot of debate. Today, she will speak about our trust in science and our trust in artificial intelligence. Do we trust technology too much? Uh, Rosanna will speak till half past one. Then you can leave if you have to attend college, or you can participate in the Q&A with Rosanna. Please give her, give her a warm welcome. Thank you very much, Hiska. Thank you to the University of Twente and the organizing committee to invite me to give this opening lecture uh, for the week of inspiration. And I hope I will inspire you a lot and uh, at least provoke some thinking about uh, these topics uh, that I will talk about today. So uh, my talk is mostly about trust in science and why we have too much of it, but I think much of it can be translated to trust in technology, trust in engineering, uh, trust in data, and trust in artificial intelligence, or this gentleman at the one <laughs> said to me, artificial intelligence doesn't exist yet. We have algorithms and that's what we should speak of. Do I interpret that correctly? Um, so I will first talk a bit about my own background. So this is me in front of a lot of fermenters. Uh, I've done a lot of bioprocess engineering and bioprocess uh, or, or fermentation technology. Um, I've studied life science and technology, which is a combination between TU Delft and Leiden University. Then I continue to do a PhD at the University of Amsterdam together with the, uh, with the food technology, uh, uh, together with Nestle, but also with Niso Food Research. And I studied there a peculiar trait of some lactic acid bacteria, lactobacillus. And what uh, this peculiar trait is that they produce hydrogen peroxide. So when we take in oxygen, we uh, uh, shed out water, H2O, but these weird lactobacilli they don't turn it into H2O, but into H2O2. And that kind of accumulates around them and eventually kills them in aerobic, um, in aerobic circumstances, which is very normal actually for bacteria and yeasts to do. You know, your wine is 14% and not more because that's how much ethanol yeast can handle. Uh, lactic acid pH never goes below 3.9 because that's how much the bacteria can handle. Um, so, and uh, yeah, perhaps you could also extrapolate this to humankind that we accumulate as much waste around us until it kills us. Um, <coughs> that may be a teaching from microbiology. I don't know if that is, that is true. Normally, we engineer our way out of this, uh, out of trouble. And we've done that many times in the past. Um, and I see a lot of gentlemen in the room, I'd say about 80%. So I'm going to warn you, I'm going to use the word vagina. Uh, because the lactobacilli that I studied together with the food uh, industry um, are actually the most prevalent vaginal bacteria. And this is me in uh, the United States, where I did a postdoc at uh, the Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, studying the same traits of these bacteria, but then um, connected to uh, female reproductive health and female he or women's health. 
So at the moment, I'm a researcher at the Systems Biology Lab at the Freie Universiteit Amsterdam, where they really take a systems approach to understand life and metabolism and how to sense and respond to the environment. But in, within this group, I managed to continue studying the lactobacillus-rich human vaginal microbiome. Um, and what is very cool about this system, so to say, is if you take an average sample of your mouth or of your gut, you will find like tens to hundreds of different bacterial species. But if you take a vaginal sample, you only find one, perhaps two, and they are always lactobacillus. About 80% of all women are dominated by lactobacilli, which creates a very low diversity a very low pH, and what's also very cool is that it's unique for humans, so there's no other ape that has this. Um, and also it's associated with good health outcomes, uh, urogenital infections, uh, fertility, miscarriage, pregnancy loss, and preterm birth. So we want to study this and we want to understand why some women have a certain microbiome versus other women uh, have less uh, lactobacilli. Um, and I specifically study bacterial carbohydrate metabolism. But I'm also working on a citizen science initiative because in actually all my work, uh, my main drive is to break down the barriers between science, between research, between academia and the public to show that there's way too much trust of the public in what happens in academia. There's way too much authority within the scientific realm. And in this citizen science initiative, I specifically ask women to come to the university, to come to the labs and show them that it's not very difficult to isolate and characterize your own bacteria. So if you want to know more, uh, you can find it at crispatis.org. But besides my work as a microbiologist and even during my study time, I loved debate. I loved to um, organize a disagreement within people, uh, between people, so a respectful disagreement. So I did a lot of what you call British parliamentary debating. I don't know if you have a debate society at the University of Twente. I don't see anybody re responding with recognition. So, okay, so there's this whole, you, you, you think there is? Yeah, there is a debate association. Okay, great. Um, so I've done a lot of, let's say, these type of tournaments. You get a motion um, uh, and your position. So for instance, you're in, in favor of torturing suspects of terrorism to withdraw the truth and save some lives and prevent a uh, next terroristic attack. Uh, you're in favor, you're against, you have 15 minutes to prepare and then it's an organized disagreement. So you learn a lot from all the different sides, from all the different arguments, and especially studying uh, technology, studying engineering. It's very cool to broaden your universe and to understand, to put yourself into the context uh, and not become too much of an expert. But I think perhaps you're here, so uh, I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, uh, this ca debating habit of mine got out of hand. Uh, I was also writing for the university newspaper. Um, uh, after I finished my studies, I continued writing for NRC Handelsblad, which is a national newspaper, um, and did many uh, television programs. Just doing what I love most is debate, argue, uh, find missing arguments, see where the argument of the other stops, and um, yeah, thereby uh, progressing our thinking of these uh, topics. So I have many conflicts of interest because what I've done now is I went back to the university, but um, uh, at the same time, I, I have one foot in the university and one foot in research, and the other foot is still firmly in thinking, in uh, writing for the newspaper and in giving talks like these. So also, in many of the subjects I talk about, I recognize that I'm a professional sideline commentator and I know my place. I know that some people stand with their feet uh, in the field and have to act, have to um, take responsibility. And I only shout from the sideline, go there, do this, watch out. Um, so my conviction is in the newspaper, you have these topics of mine, science, and opinion, and they are two neatly separated topics, and we like that. We especially like that since Brexit and Trump, since fake news and since alternative facts. We like that there are facts, that is science, and there's opinion, and that is something else. Uh, but in reality, what you find is these two are strongly interconnected and intertwined even. The good thing is, um, 
I always get to, get to present myself the way I choose. So I'm a researcher or I'm a columnist, I will definitely choose to introduce myself as a researcher for this audience. So I'm a researcher, I'm an academic, I'm a scholar. I use science to get to the truth more than commentator because you, the public, trusts science a lot. Although we talk endlessly about the loss in trust and nobody understands the facts, and during COVID we didn't respect research, it's even, it, it even got worse during COVID. From all these fields, I'm sorry, it's in Dutch, but um, from all these fields, corporate, parliament, government, television, newspapers, but even law, even the judges, courts, um, have a lower trust level in the public than science science, academia, and re uh, scientific research. We have a tremendous amount of trust in research, and it's quite stable, actually. And if you take 2021, um, uh, 2021 as a last year, it only increased during COVID times. They kept it out for a while because uh, during COVID times, actually, there was more trust in research. I don't know if you expected this. Who th yeah, you would have expected this, no? No. Well, if you ask people, I and mean, if you ask the public, they at least say that they have a lot of trust in science. Um, I think this is a problem. <laughs> uh, a lot of people think it's a problem that there's mistrust in science, but I think there's a problem when there's too much trust in science. And that's why I wrote this book. It's called The Big Nothing, uh, with a subtitle, Why We Have Too Much Confidence in Science, and especially underestimate um, our own irrationality. So let's talk about science a little bit. This structured method, it's many things, of course. It's a method of, uh, of getting to the truth, but it's also a community. It's a language, it's a culture. Um, but let's talk about the method. And if you talk about the method, it's great to generate knowledge. But you can also use science to prove you're right. You can also use, oh, something went really wrong here. I'm sorry. You see, it's 2023, we can't even make a PowerPoint work. Um, you can use science to answer questions. I think that's the right way to use science. But you can also use science to provide credibility to your irrational beliefs, and you can use science to sell products. So for instance, Coca-Cola, we'll give an example of that. Coca-Cola uh, company has for a long time sponsored research into the benefits of exercise for health. So the question is, is exercise good for your health? And the answer is always, from research, yes. Exercise is very good for your health. The answer is also, drinking less Coca-Cola is also very good for your health. But that doesn't come out of the research because that was not the question. Okay, so this is how you lie with science. This is how you manipulate science. And this is how you use authority of science for your products. Um, but even if you don't, even if you don't, if you're not Coca-Cola and you don't use science in this way, it turns out scientists are not always very scientific. And one of the examples was uh, during the early times in the, in the COVID crisis, uh, we, had, we had a new virus, we had a new viral infection, and we had to determine very rapidly what was the main mode of transmission. So what interventions could we do to make sure that there were less infections going on? And one of the questions was, so how, do we, how is transmission happening? And uh, the lead infectious disease expert in the Netherlands, Jaap van Dissel, always said, um, at least the face mask, they have very little effect. Um, and also, if you, if you look at what the main interventions was, it was washing your hands, keeping a distance, and testing. Turns out, um, this was probably pretty wrong. For, for instance, like touch contact surface transmission was only a very small, a very limited uh, effect, uh, a very limited way of transmitting coronavirus. And, all, and through the air, especially through smaller aerosols, there was way more risk to uh, get infected. And after a long time in the Netherlands, the public health administrations and the RIVM, the researchers, they had to admit and they had to change the official guidelines that, yes, uh, transmission of corona can happen through these small droplets on 
uh, longer distances, taking away those first two interventions that we so uh, clearly communicated to the public, do this to prevent coronavirus infection, perhaps they were wrong. Um, this has not only happened in the Netherlands, if you, even if you look at the World Health Organizations, for a long time they could not say out loud that COVID was an airborne viral infection, something very basic that could have been distilled from the evidence so far. They were very reluctant uh, to talk about these aerosols. And in the Netherlands we had um, especially one person, Maurice de Hond, who talked about aerosols everywhere he went, so perhaps also that was the reason why scientists couldn't accept it anymore because there was also already one person that they had very little trust in who was saying this. So how does this, how does this go wrong? How for the biggest pandemic in the last century we get the transmitting routes wrong? And why does it take two years to uh, change this view? Well, if you read the article it says, firstly, there's way too much medical perspective in the infectious disease field. And if you want to prevent hospital infections, uh, nonsocomial infections, you better wash your hands. If you want to prevent uh, MRSA, antibiotic resistant stuff aureus, you wash your hands. You make sure that everything is very, very clean. And they just extrapolated that to the public. And also, a typical uh, example of tunnel visions. Only cite the evidence that support your position. And what's so striking to me is that, one second, I'll finish the slide. Um, what's so striking to me is that if you think about all those countries worldwide looking at the same evidence of COVID transmission and coming to opposite conclusions, because in Southeast Asia and in East Asia, they never took away face masks after SARS-1. It is very normal, and it was a question of in doubt, let's advise face masks, whereas it was typically Northwestern European, Sweden, Norway, England, and so forth, where uh, people were very reluctant to, ask, uh, to uh, use face masks. So my question is, how scientific was this? How scientific were our scientific advisors? To me, it turns out they're very human after all. They're sensitive to rhetorics, to ideology, to dogma, to culture, to peer pressure, to, um, and to a lot of self-overestimation. There was a question here. This lady here um, asks me uh, whether it was also um, a consequence of having a face mask sh shortage. Well, one thing, this uh, communication lasted way longer than the real shortage. And secondly, even if that's the case, why do you then say it has little effect? So fine, but you use your scientific authority to misclaim what you learn from the science to solve a practical problem. I think that's deeply problematic for scientific... But, I mean, let's debate it a bit longer because I have a lot more to say. Is that okay for you? All right. So I just wanted to, and especially in this audience, especially in universities and especially in technical universities, I want to show this picture, how many different sources of knowledge one could use, and not only one could use, but we all use. So you use the way that you were brought up. You use the knowledge and the wisdom of your culture of the time spirit that you live in. For instance, the tremendous amount of individuality um, instead of community uh, in this time and age. Uh, the thought leaders, the religion that you may be brought up in. Um, of all these different, and science is only one of them. And to, to just stress the fact how much, for instance, we use intuition in scientific organizations, such as an academic hospital, only about 50% of everything that's done in an academic hospital is evidence-based. And my own mother is a pediatrician in an academic hospital. Um, and she would also always say, yeah, there's science, but I use my gut feeling. If I see a kid in front of me, I always try to, try to sense how sick are you. And a kid may be playing around, but may be very sick and needs to be admitted as soon as possible. Or seems very sick, but only has a stomach bug and needs to be sent home and put to bed. Um, we call this in Dutch pluis niet pluis gevoel, and we use it a lot. We use it a lot in our daily lives. We use science a lot 
to give authority to irrational beliefs. And we use science to avoid fundamental debates. I want to tell you one story. The Dutch teams in international debating tournaments uh, performed really good. Partially because we speak good English, but also partially because we're just good at this game. Um, and there were two world champions, uh, Lars Duursma and Victor Flam, and they remarked that we especially perform really well when it's practical debate. Uh, when it's debate about uh, yeah, practical solutions to problems, things that are tangible. And once it's about fundaments, principles, human rights, the Dutch were not very good. And they give a manual about how we can avoid having to talk about underlying principles. So I'll give a few examples, mostly around Corona, because that was just a gold mine of this. Um, so for instance, one may say, yeah, but it's only temporary. So it's not worth the discussions, for instance, Corona pass, uh, curfew, uh, lockdown, etc. Then it turns out it's not that temporary. So then you say, well, now we're already doing it. So now actually the debate is too late, so we're not going to have the discussion. You can use the salami technique. You chop something controversial up in very small pieces. So you say the Corona pass is not for supermarkets. It's only for restaurants. Um, or you say a curfew, the avondklok. We're going to have a curfew, but does it start at 8 p.m. or 8.30? That's a true debate that we had in national parliament, whether the curfew starts at 8 or 8.30. Um, then you have a caricature, caricature, straw man. But if we can never do this, you don't want to know how many times when I opposed corona pass and mandatory vaccination, um, uh, you know how, how many times people mentioned variola to me, smallpox. They said, but in case of smallpox. Now, smallpox kills mostly young people, and it's about 30% or so mortality. It's severely deadly, and it's also very, very contagious. So to say, it's not COVID. So if you, you can use this uh, uh, as a caricature. So to say, but if, if, if I follow you, what if smallpox comes, you know? Okay, then the pedophile terrorist argument, or the wacko or wappie argument, Willem Engel argument, I also call it, for the people who know who that is. So, uh, for instance, you also see this in the privacy discussion. Oh, you like privacy? You know who else likes privacy? Terrorists, pedophiles. Um, do, do, you, do you care? Do you, you know, they're very happy with your arguments. And also, oh, you oppose Corona Pass? So, you know who also does that? So that's another way, to avoid having to talk about the underlying principles. And then there's science. And that's just basically claiming, oh, sorry, we have a misunderstanding here. This topic is not to be debated. This is about facts. We should leave this to the experts. There's data here, um, and this data tells us what to do. Um, it's about engineering, it's an engineering problem, and we should leave it to the experts. And you saw this actually a lot in Parliament. Uh, especially in the Democrats. You see they use this quite a bit. We should leave it to the experts. I understand your feelings, I see your emotions, but I'm going to keep to the facts. I have science on my side. All right. And even the Prime Minister, when there were ideological, deeply ideological choices to be made, he referred to Health Council a lot. So for instance, he said, so who should be vaccinated first? Like, should that be the elderly? Should that be the healthcare uh, health workers? Um, let's ask Health Council. And Health Council always said, no, 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 this is political. This is ideology. This, is, this should be uh, decided in Parliament and by the government. Um, and to me, that was one of the deep learnings. We try to delegate so much to science, trusting in science um, and the scientific realm of, of uh, you know, TU Delft, engineers, data people, um, uh, to make sure that we don't talk about the ideological choices that are underlying this thing. And you see it also in many other debates, for instance. Um, and you see how algorithms are also used a lot um, it's called evidence-based politics or evidence-based policy. In the nitrogen debate, there was at one point, or, or still is, the ARIES algorithm. And the ARIES algorithm would decide the deposition of nitrogen 
uh, yeah, of nitrogen deposition. So mostly ammonia, but also nitro nitrogen oxides. Um, and you know, the administrators, the people in The Hague said, we're going to let this algorithm decide. And I, I'm quoting from a, from a report from the Nieuwe Denktank. So the algorithm tells us, if a permit can be handed out, if an activity or a farm or company should disappear or not, what we should do to protect nature, administration does not bear responsibility, it can trust in the algorithm, there's no risk or unf of unfair treatment because the al algorithm is indiscriminate, does not discriminate, and the decision does not require any motivation, because the computer said no. So that's currently uh, uh, what we see happening in the nitrogen debate, but we saw it in many other of the affairs. For instance, the use of algorithms to decide which houses in Groningen uh, needed to be uh, repaired by, uh, or the damage was caused by the earthquakes and uh, from the gas, uh, from the natural gas winning in uh, Groningen in the north of the Netherlands. I don't know how many Dutch people are here actually, but I don't know how well you're informed of the national policies. But okay, I'll just continue. Now the next question is, so is this level of trust in science technology and technology justified? And I think no, uh, because at the moment what we're seeing is some sort of a replication crisis, you may call it. Um, and this started in social psychology. And what it means is that if you take from a field the most important topics, um, you end up, uh, uh, the, the most important topics, you basically uh, try to repeat those studies and it gives you different results. So the results don't hold up. And this started in social psychology, so for instance where you have ego depletion studies, this, and perhaps you read it in Psychology Magazine or Men's Health Magazine or any other of the books that you're reading, in Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow, that your willpower is a muscle that gets tired in the day. So in the morning, if you, had, if you chose broccoli over chocolate cookies, and later, if you used your willpower already, perhaps that muscle got a bit um, tired, and now later in the day, uh, that willpower is not so strong. Well, they repeat the studies, and just the results don't hold up. Same counts for priming, the idea that we can subconsciously steer your behavior. For instance, in a dirty environment, you become more unfriendly, you become more racist, you become more um, uh, less trustful towards other people. The results don't hold true. And this has already emanated in literature and in popular, popular books, etc. Then there's psychiatry and genetics. You know, there was this a waste of a thousand research papers about one genetic polymorphism. And this 5-HTTLPR polymorphism was extensively described, how it was involved in your risk of having a depression after psychological trauma. After a bigger study was done, uh, a, a GWAS, a genetic wide association study, turns out the polymorphism is not even involved in this aspect. It was all a waste. It was, the whole field was misguided. And then we take preclinical research, preclinical cancer research, sorry. So even there, something that we, uh, has very, very high esteem in our society, because I mean, these people cure cancer, right? So um, also there, especially in the animal studies and in the tissue culture, you see that um, about 50%, especially in the small effects, uh, don't hold up when you repeat it. It was actually industry who started this, who said, well, uh, it's very cool that this is published in Cell Nature Science, but it just doesn't hold up in our labs. We can't make cancer medicine with this. So no, I don't think this level of trust in science and technology is justified, or at least this is science. Let's go to data science. So I thought, I always believed that if you have an algorithm and you program it with a lot of rules that then in the end, this is reproducible, right? It must be, because the algorithm does the same thing over and over again. Turns out, especially in machine learning, there may also be a reproducibility crisis. For instance, a problem with data leakage. Who knows what that is? How many IT people are here, information technology? Do you know what data, is that a term that you know? So it means you use data, you use data to train your to do the machine learning, to train your algorithm on. 
but the data actually contain the data that it needs to spew out, the output. So it already had a vision into the future. And let's look at how open this is, how verifiable algorithms even are. So in 2018, 6% of all the code was public. Now it's 15, or last year was 15%. So what I'm learning from this is that the algorithm is not, as I thought, fallible. And machine learning, although that sounds weird, is a largely a human endeavor. Let's go to the triumphs of algorithms, because there were many, of course. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't. we all remember this, perhaps, the first time that a computer beat, or we know at least that this happened, a computer that beat the best chess player of that time. Um, and then later on, there were machine learning chess computers that just learned how to play chess and then afterwards learned how to play Go and beat the best Go player at his own game. So that's, that's, that's a computer that can learn so, uh, so much from just being fed all these, all these matches and all these outcomes and then just plays an incredible game. Another, uh, the, 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 the grandfather of ChatGPT, a language model called Watson by IBM, was the first time to beat um, uh, in a world that is not as structured and clear as the 64 uh, fields of a chessboard. Uh, so this was a Jeopardy, which is a, uh, a quiz, an American quiz, where it gives you the answer and then you must, uh, uh, you must answer with the question. Do you know Jeopardy? Does anybody know Jeopardy? This is old. You know it. You're like, I know. <laughs> um, so, and then this was big news when the first IBM language model, Watson, won this competition. Um, so then IBM went like, so this is awesome, this is great, this language model uh, is a uh, capable of a lot. Everybody was astonished, perhaps it was the chat GPT moment of, of, um, of uh, 20 years ago. What can we, where can we apply this? Where can we make use of this? And they thought healthcare we're going to cure cancer. So the idea was to make it safe cost and improve quality in oncology. Let me see. So what happened? The results was when Watson started to help oncologists, it went horribly wrong. At least it only provided a lot of open doors and a lot of irrelevant proposals. So, and then it basically crashed and burned and it was sold off for its part. So now IBM is not dead, or uh, Watson is not dead. IBM is a bit dead. Well, IBM is also still alive, just like Watson, still in the business to business. And Watson still has parts of it that automizes uh, corporate activity. And uh, I love this book, Range, by David Epstein. It talks about how we need less experts and more broadly trained people. I can definitely recommend it. But he talks about how IBM Watson failed uh, revolutionizing, uh, revolutionizing oncology. And he writes, the difference between winning at Jeopardy and curing all cancers that we know the answers to Jeopardy questions. It's an infill oefening. The answer, there is a right answer and it's known somewhere out there. Um, but with cancer, we're still working out to pose the right questions in the first place. And the difference between this is very much the kind learning environments versus the wicked learning environments. And they refer to it in the book as tennis on Mars, Martian tennis. So you can see the players on a court with balls and rackets, but nobody has shared what the rules are. And it's up to you to derive them and they're subject to change without notice. So how, t how a model behaves in the Martian tennis setup is very different. And it's way more difficult to really provide value. So the previous oversold language model crashed and burned, sold for its parts. And now we have a new uh, language model that makes all the headlines and makes us very scared of all our jobs. Are we still useful? You can read it in the newspaper every day. I talk to some people in the audience and you're not that scared, right? Who's, who thinks your job, you're going to be superfluous by chat GP? Yeah, you think? Oh, I, yeah. I hope I can convince you otherwise. Um, so I like this Atlantic piece about how America forgot about IBM Watson. So is ChatGPT next? Because it's a new language model that has a lot of uh, promise. So imagine that Watson, IBM Watson, to feed Watson all this medical data, IBM actually ended up purchasing 
health organizations for billions of dollars spending it to get the data. That's where the big data and the data are the new gold uh, sayings are coming from. It didn't go very far, at least. So um, in this article, they talk about Einstein GPT, one of the uh, ways to make money with ChatGPT. So it's a product that uses OpenAI's technology to draft sales emails, part of a trend that Evans recently described as the boring automation of boring processes in the boring back offices of boring companies. Watson's legacy, a big name attached to a humble purpose, is playing out yet again. So now I'm not sure if I completely follow this, and I think we, no one can tell whether this is being oversold or that this is really giving the value that we now ascribe to it and also the dangers. Um, but at least I don't see a lot of mention of the previous language model, do you? Um, what I see now, and it turns out that what, or Watson, ChatGPT is much better at answering questions, random questions that patients ask on fora. So if you judge uh, how ChatGPT does that, it does that a lot better. But these are like the low-hanging fruit, right? So I think that AI is going to take over a lot of the boring parts of the job, like getting the grammar right, or getting the editing right, or making exam questions. I mean, I don't know who takes pleasure in that. But, um, and healthcare, the triage also. So how sick is this patient? Perhaps the pediatricians are still going to be of some value, but at least what happens when you get a little droplet of bleach in your eye, uh, ChatGPT can also take good care of that. So every age has its own oversold science that eventually found its use after all. 19th century chemistry, ma majorly oversold. So, for instance, this guy Theodore Gobley, he searched for the consciousness chemical because everything could be done with chemistry, right? We could feed, uh, we could feed humankind, we could make all kinds of colors, we could make medication. So in the brain, there must also be a consciousness chemical. He didn't find it. He did discover phospholipids and vanillin. And of course, chemistry ha had a huge impact on all our lives. But it didn't ha once it was an oversold science. Um, genetics was oversold. I'm going to run through this a bit uh, faster. Genetics was once oversold. So DNA is not telling you what you have to eat or what your baby's personality is going to be like or what medication to use. Microbiome, my own field very much oversold, that the gut bacteria will determine, we can tell from your gut bacteria what to eat, what medication to use, your personality, but it does have its uses. And the question is now, overselling AI, super intelligence, super fluid workers, but also at the same time giving a revolution in programming, in text, and in a lot of the boring parts of our jobs. I don't know what you thought this year was going to look like, but somewhere I believed that it was look like this. We can put our feet up, finally, to let the dirty work be done by the robots. In reality, we have massive labor shortages, and everybody I know works harder than ever before. Trains are not running, planes are not flying, because we have too little people to do everything. Our um, uh, werkgelegenheid, our unemployment rates are lower than they have ever been before. And imagine how many workers we have managed to absorb. Early 20th century, all the farmers come from the fields because we don't need as many farmers and as, many, as much work on the fields anymore. We have all given them jobs. They're not unemployed. All the soldiers, the huge armies that we had, they are now workers. In the 60s, all the women went to work. And nobody said they're taking our job. Well, they said it, but it never happened. We all absorb them, and we, humankind has an endless capacity to create work. We always come up with new things. Um, we're always capable to come up with new ways to keep us busy. Um, and I also definitely recommend David Graeber's Bullshit Jobs, and then you understand that ChatGPT is not going to take your job. We're just going to make you become burnout with some other useless activity. So, that's what I think the new picture should look like. So we have all the same things in place. In, oh, sorry, this is still in Dutch. Sources of knowledge, reliable versus unreliable. AI is going to have its own play, place amongst all these things. Um, in the end, we see that the victory is for cyborgs and centaurs. So 
the com combination of the man and machine. And in chess now, uh, they organized once this um, uh, freestyle chess where you could choose whatever team you want. Two computers, three computers, one computer and two engineers, one computer and a grandmaster. You could choose whatever team you want. And it turns out the humans and the machines, the duos, they work best. But the man is not the grandmaster. The man is somebody creative and strategic. Um, so the lessons for today that I hope that, that are lessons for me, do not overestimate the influence of science, of data science, of algorithms, and of technology. Do not underestimate your own irrationality, uh, which is both a human weakness and a tremendous strength. And lastly, make sure that trust in infallible algorithms, uh, but also in s infallible experiments, are not abused by administrators, companies, hospitals, scientists, to abandon responsibility, because after all, it's still a human world. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rosanna. You delivered your talk with a lot of energy, <laughs> especially at the end of it, and a lot of content. Um, it's now time uh, to raise questions. First, I would, take the I would like to take the opportunity to ask the first question. You uh, talked uh, a lot about uh, the barrier between citizens and scientists, between academia and society. Uh, we are here with a lot of people who are studying at the university or working at the university or in any way related to the university. And I assume that they uh, already are a little bit aware of your message, don't trust science too much. Yes, you, uh, please go to Bye. college if you have, Thank to, you. have, have to go. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, Yes, All the non-students <laughs> can stay. We'll wait a little bit. <laughs> yeah, well. it's unfortunate that we don't have the discussion with students because I was very curious. But well, it's a bit more quiet now, so I will continue my question to yes. Rosanne. Because I was saying that uh, you were talking uh, about the bridge, the, the barrier between citizens and scientists or society and academia. We are here with a lot of people connected to the university. And I'm assuming that they are aware or a little bit aware or maybe not of your message that uh, people uh, put too much trust in science. But the general public, how do you reach them with your message? because the general public doesn't read the NSA, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you reach the general public who says, uh, we read this uh, on Facebook? So yeah, it's I, the truth. How do you reach them? Yeah, I don't know. And it's also, the, you know, asking a writer to, what's the purpose? It's like, do I really want to change like how the world, how the world works, or just serve my readers. Yes. Uh, so it's somewhere in between, right? It's, uh, but it's most more towards serve my readers. And okay. Yeah. So, so I don't know if I want to change the world with this vision. With I think yes. it's. I think it gives an insight. But what I disagree with is what you said that this is already apparent or common knowledge in academia. I don't think so at all. I think a lot of people. Uh, do have the arrogance, I'm going to put it mm -hmm, as, mm -hmm. f as, as, as strong as that, uh, the arrogance that more science and more money towards science and more authority and more say and more seats at the outbreak management team mm -hmm. with different scientists, not mm -hmm. the public, but different scientists from different fields. I think that there's uh, still uh, too much. This trust. message also yes. needs to be brought to universities, especially engineers. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Questions of you. Um, yeah, you talked about uh, citizens and and the trust in science, and I feel that during the pandemic, a lot of people uh, sort of didn't really trust the authority of science, and they said, "I do my own research." Mm -hmm. But it seemed that they couldn't differentiate between 
authoritative science and the scientific method. Mm -hmm. So because the, the basis of the scientific method is being critical and they were critical to the mainstream story, but somehow they were not critical to all the other stories. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like we missed an opportunity there to tell them, okay, nice that you're critical, but now this is the scientific method, be critical to everything. Yeah. So mm -hmm. can you maybe say something about that? That's how could, yeah, did we miss an opportunity there or how could we let those people yeah, train in the scientific method in a sort of accessible way? We train a lot in the scientific method, uh, from MBO to HBO, there's onderzoeksvaardigheden uh, standard in all the curricula. What happens is that, uh, what I think, is that uh, the examples I gave from mainstream science, from the RIVM, from Jaap van Dissel, uh, is exactly the way that the wackos and the, and the conspiracy thinkers use science. Just like vaccination, all the examples in favor, or the data in favor of vaccination, are used, the anti-vaccination doesn't say, my belief system says we should not shield children from infectious disease, they say these data, these data show um, that. Uh, so they use science also to abuse and to mislead and to lie. Um, and they do it on purpose and they use the same systems that give authority uh, to the wrong beliefs, sometimes in mainstream science, um, for their own beliefs. And that's what, that's to me, that's not different from what Coca-Cola company does when it researches exercise for health. It's not different from what uh, Jaap van Dissel does when he says the literature says uh, face masks are not effective. Um, they say the data says that uh, measles cause autism. I even have some case studies, case studies, examples, also used by science case studies. You see, so I think they use a lot of the same methods to uh, give credibility to their beliefs. And, and uh, so what, what we should learn is debate and not science. The science is a way to get to, the, to, to increase our, our understanding, to get to more understanding of our reality. But what, what is really happening there is why we disagree. Why do they go the other way? Because they have another belief system. They have another thinking about health and disease, which is not always scientific. It's something cultural, it's something dogmatic, it's something that you get from your parents. So step away from the science, please, and make it what it is. A debate about values, about norms, about... Yeah. Is that... Mm -hmm. Over there, Jinte. So information is not very convincing. People forget that. It's not because of a difference in information that people make choices. Yeah. Okay, please ask your question. Yeah, so maybe a bit of a futuristic question, mm -hmm. but um, there might be a limit to what we can understand as humans because of the limitation of our school. Of our, uh, yeah, school. Uh, brains can only be so big. Should we trust in the answer that AI might provide that, we, that they are too complex for us to understand? Say again, say again. Our brains, our brains are limited. Yeah, but yeah. we can provide, we can make very large networks that can maybe get to more complex solutions to our right. problems. Yeah. Should we trust in the pro the solutions that we can't understand ourselves, but are m from sm smarter intelligence forms than we are? Mm -hmm. uh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, I have a problem with that. I would like to know always where things come from, because uh, these. Uh, yeah, uh, case neural networks, this gentleman in the front uh, is a specialist on that. Uh, in case of neural networks, you always feed that with information, with data. The language models train on, on human, uh, human texts. Uh, so, including racism, including sexism, including... Uh, so, uh, yeah, the chances that you are uh, fraudulent with your taxes um, yeah, if I study the data, then it makes sense to study your last name, especially your skin color. Do we think that's according to our values? No. So I would like to know uh, where things come from and how it got to certain, certain decisions. Yeah. So I think I think may give a, a way more uh, solutions and and inventions, but the question is where it comes from. Now, I would like to know as a human where it comes from, yeah, how, it, how it took those decisions. 
Okay, last question. Is that something that resonates? Over there? Uh, first of all, thank you for your uh, very nice talk. I had the question about uh, uh, how the, our politics, or like Dutch people in general, uh, avoid the fundamental discussions uh, and uh, sometimes use science as a way out just to mm -hmm. not talk about it anymore. But is it, it more uh, that the, why people in the politics do, uh, politics do this just, uh, they're not, not taking their responsibility and not necessarily that uh, too much trust in science is bad because I think uh, in a way that even if there's a lot of trust in science, I think right now is the case, then we'd still be able to just use it as one, uh, just still be able to have these fundamental discussions. Um, what do you think about yeah, that? Yeah, theoretically, yes. I hope so, that you can have, because uh, that's also, I mean, I do science all day, every day, so, so I don't think that it's useless or anything, or that we shouldn't use it as an informative uh, studies to inform debates and so. But uh, what I do notice is that debates nowadays tend to um, often, uh, often result into fact uh, smashing. So uh, here are some studies from uh, my side and here are some f studies from my side. The idea um, that one is right if the experiments are right. So I'll give you one example, the universal basic income. So the idea that everybody should have a universal basic income as a minimum income, basically, for everybody. It's a deeply ideological debate, right? It's a verdelingsvraagstuk. It's a, a who earns what in society and should there be a basis? And, um, and I saw that debate end up in talking about experiments. Oh, they tried it here and people... Uh, so how, do, how should you craft an experiment and how should you interpret the results? And both sides of the political field, of course, say the experiment should be crafted like this. No, it should be done like this. We should measure illness, we should measure work, we should measure employment, we should measure happiness, whatever. And everything about that is deeply ideological and yet we speak about these experiments. You see what I mean? Now, can I ask this yes, gentleman? Yes, yes, so I'm going to ask you, you a question. You have the honor to I'm ask the questions. last question. So this is how I write my <laughs> columns, right? I get <laughs> annoyed, and then after a few days, I know why I get annoyed and what I want to say about it. <laughs> so what was the phrase that annoys you most? <laughs> I think science is about the only way forward to come to some kind of truth, but it's not impartial. And debate, if, if, I, if I read your story right, debate should level the field, because science is the only thing we know that actually works. You got a question, you got a problem, you research it, you come yeah. up with a solution, and you go on. But it's not impartial, and that's okay. where one one of one of the many problems are. So, and debate should level that field. But to what level should we get it right in debate to get forward with science? Because debating about it, I mean, it's one of my gripes. Talking about it doesn't solve anything. You have to do something. So science does, does things, and debate only talks about it. But obviously <laughs> it's necessary, because science doesn't do it right Yeah, it doesn't say what to do, and it doesn't say what you do, either. Well, engineering does, I suppose, but engineering comes from... No, engineering doesn't tell you what to do. Well, it goes forward to, making, to uh, actually implementing solutions. Possible solutions. Possible solutions, yeah. To <laughs> problems that we have yeah. made up that we have established as a problem. Yeah. So everything about that whole thing is irrational and human. It doesn't mean that it doesn't do good things or so. Quite. Right. Okay, but let me even say, so science is the only way to the truth, right? You know who loves to say that? Robert Dijkgraaf. It he said this in a, in a lecture in the University of Leiden. He said, the weg naar de waarheid, which reminds me a lot Mm -hmm, religion. Right, right. He even says, science knocks on the door and people do not open, which reminds me a lot. Okay, so um, I want to go to quantum mechanics. I'm getting onto slippery slope here. Who's, mm -hmm. a, who's a physicist? All right, good. <laughs> all right, I'm being watched. That's all right. Um, so if I understand correctly from quantum mechanics, we have a 
big problem in science, right? In materialism. We have a problem that two quantum particles in very distant locations take the same orientation. So basically you throw a dice on this side of the planet, and you throw a dice on that side of the planet, and it turns up the same number every time you try. Am I right? Uh, quantum entanglement? Yeah, yeah, yeah? yeah. okay. <laughs> Second problem. Schrodinger's cat is alive and dead until you watch, then it's either alive or it's dead, which has been experimentally proven with a slit experiment, right? The particles go through both slits at the same time until you watch, then it goes to one through one of both slits. So by observing, we change reality, and there's a strange entanglement on a quantum level between reality. Am I saying this right? Yeah. Okay, just want to check. So, uh, and the physicists, many physicists say nowadays, the answer to this problem, that we don't understand the real art van de werkelijkheid, the essence of reality. Essence of reality. Thank you. <laughs> that we don't understand reality and we cannot explain it from science, right? This because this goes way beyond even... The, so uh, we need philosophy. We may even need religion because the religious traditions, the mystic traditions, uh, philosophy, teachings, Plato, Neoplatonism, uh, monotheism have already said Everything is God and God is one. Everything is connected. So there's this whole new generation of thinkers that say, no, the answer goes beyond physics. We need a new way of understanding this problem because we're stuck, basically. We don't understand it with scientific experiments. So I don't know if it's the only way to... I mean, Robert Dijkgraaf still believes this, so and he knows a lot about these topics. So. Perhaps it is, but I think we should look a bit broader than that. <laughs> I will continue. <laughs> I will continue to do science and to do scientific experiments because I think that the answers that I'm trying to answer can be answered through these experiments. But um, I don't know if that's true for all science and all societal questions and all problems that we can engineer our way out of them. Yes, true. We are going to end. <laughs> We're going here to end this session. I'm sorry, you sir. You I'm sorry, sir. Yeah. You really give us a lot of uh, things to think about and to debate about because it's not ready yet. I can see it in your face. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, in that sense, you were a really inspirational speaker and the best start of our week of inspiration. So, please give a warm applause to Rosanna. Thank you. <laughs>